of the recording message. Following this, he went on to do a fellowship in immunocompromised infectious diseases at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, where he also completed his master's in tropical medicine and international health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I think you get the picture. This guy has had a lot of training and he knows what he's talking about. During his time in London and throughout the COVID pandemic, Justin was engaged in pediatric research through clinical trials such as recovery in bats and co-led the MIS-C Multidisciplinary Committee and Follow-Up Clinic. Apart from his work in COVID-19, he is an active member of the PENTA Group on Congenital Infections and the CCMV Net European Congenital Infections, Infections Working Group. And the title of this presentation for this morning is Pediatric Pandemic Potpourri, COVID-19 Treatments in Children. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Penner in this presentation and over to you, Justin. Thanks so much, Mona. Can you everyone hear me, hopefully? Yes, Perfect. very well. So we were just uh, speaking offline before that uh, hopefully this is timely uh, presentation, but I'm hoping that it's less timely as the months to come, although unfortunately I think COVID is here to stay. Um, However, uh, this makes uh, treatment of COVID uh, all that much more important, especially as it evolves over the next months, and then certainly it's uh, due to evolve further over the following years. Um, so today, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to focus more on treatments, but um, uh, and certainly the the available evidence based and or the lack of evidence based, particularly in pediatrics, um, as it pertains to COVID-19 pharmacological therapies. I'm also gonna uh, touch briefly on what uh, the future holds with regards to pharmacological interventions uh, as it pertains to pediatric COVID-19 and how evidence from the adult world will hopefully at some point trickle down a bit more to the pediatrics world. And, and of importance, uh, especially when it pertains to treatments of, of COVID-19, I'm going to try to frame it in the context of timing and severity of COVID-19 disease uh, and how that affects uh, treatment decision-making. And lastly, just because I do think that this is a, really the most important aspect of treatment uh, in COVID-19 in pediatric populations is really defining who are the population at risk and, and when and, and what to treat these patients with. I don't have any disclosures, although as uh, Mona mentioned, um, I did work on the recovery trial, which is the one of the largest uh, trials uh, in England and now worldwide for uh, COVID-19 treatments. Uh, as well as MIS-C treatment. So I've tried not to overemphasize that, uh, although a lot of the evidence we have so far comes from that trial. Um, I also hold a grant um, as part of a group looking at uh, the immunology of PIMS-TS MIS-C patients, but I'm not gonna talk about that uh, today. What we won't talk about, so I'm not gonna talk about vaccines, although we all know the importance of vaccines and I will have a one kind of one word in one of my slides to emphasize that. Um, I'm gonna, concentrate predominantly on uh, COVID-19. And in this context, I'll refer to COVID-19 as COVID-19 respiratory disease. And I won't touch so much on PIMS-TS or MIS-C as it's known here, or other SARS-CoV-2 related illnesses in children like uh, neurological presentations, uh, gastroenterological presentations, or other single organ diseases. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard in depth about the epidemiology, epidemiology of COVID-19 in children and in adults. So I'm only gonna touch briefly on that to, at the beginning to kind of frame uh, the context of treatment. And I won't discuss long-term outcomes, although that will become increasingly important in the future, I'm sure. So I'm just gonna start off by, uh, uh, with a quick anecdote to kind of frame how I became involved with COVID, uh, although I think it was slightly inevitable uh, looking back now. So I was about uh, halfway through my uh, pediatric infectious diseases immunocompromised fellowship at uh, Great Ormond Street. Uh, and just after Christmas, I heard in, uh, of 2019 going into 2020, we heard uh, inklings of this, this interesting new virus that's come out of, uh, of Wuhan. And I turned to my colleague who's pictured here, one of my uh, fellow, um, fellow fellows uh, at Great Ormond Street, um, Neela Alders, who's now uh, a consultant infectious diseases uh, physician at the Antwerp uh, um, uh, Tropical Medicine Institute. And I, I, I said, I turned to her and I said, what is all of this hoopla about? I said, when I was in medical school, my first year of medical school was the first SARS and nothing came about with that. I'm sure the same thing will happen with this virus. Well, needless to say, I was wrong. And I can admit that now I was very wrong um, because as you can see here, only a couple of months later, 
cases in London and, and really globally started to pick up, but certainly in, in London was one of the first epicenters. Um, we, in the first wave, um, accommodated almost all pediatric patients north of the Thames uh, River, uh, particularly as it pertained to COVID uh, 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 treatment and uh, critically ill COVID pediatric patients. Uh, opening more than 100 pediatric uh, ICU beds, uh, including a 16 bed uh, isolated uh, COVID-19 uh, unit that only uh, take, took in uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, pediatric patients uh, and PIMS-TS patients in the end. Um, we were hit particularly hard in the second wave with the Kent uh, variant, uh, subsequently known as the, the Alpha uh, variant in which we were ended up being one of the uh, only two uh, PICUs that was taking COVID-19 critically ill patients in the greater London area with a catchment of about 16 million people. So needless to say, when all this settled down during the summertime, um, I owed Neela a uh, round of Belgian beer for being quite wrong. Uh, so my main epidemiological message, and I'm going to just have two slides, two or three slides on this, is that uh, severe COVID in children is quite rare. And I will try to prove this to you with a little bit of data. So um, the ICERIC uh, um, database is a very large database in the UK, which uh, enrolled uh, um, all COVID-19 uh, patients. So in total, about a third of all patients admitted in the UK with COVID-19 are included in this database. So at the point in time when this was published, this first article, it included over 20,000 uh, patients. And as you can see, see in the diamond graph here, the percentage of uh, the population admitted to hospital with COVID-19 in pediatric patients was, in comparison, really, really small. Um, about 1.5% of the total were under 18 years of age, and about two-thirds of that comprised patients uh, under five uh, years old, which really only comprised about 1%. And as you can see on the uh, right side, a lot of the comorbidities Comorbidities that were seen in patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19 really were comorbidities you see predominantly in adults, so chronic cardiac disease, diabetes, um, other conditions associated with metabolic syndrome and chronic kidney disease, etc. So further to this, as the numbers started to rise, and as you can see on the graph on the left, uh, based on the age group, so the, the light blue is the 10 to 15 years old, uh, the burgundy colors, the five to nines, the one to fours in the gray, and the blue is the younger children under one. Even though those numbers gradually rose over the springtime uh, in the first wave, actually on the right side, as you can see here, the dotted lines is that the deaths in children, so zero to 15 in England, uh, over that same time frame, really didn't change at all. In fact, they, they decreased um, uh, for all, all, all cause mortality. So at the time of publishing this particular article, um, four children had died directly from COVID-19 uh, in England, of which were the age 10 to 15, and three of the four had multiple comorbidities. And I'll talk about uh, comorbidities at the end as well. But as we all know, we're in a little bit of a different phase of COVID at the moment with the new Omicron variant. So is Omicron different in children. Um, so as you know, Omicron is relatively new in the grand scheme of things. And so the data is only just starting to trickle in. And I'm sure in the following months, we'll have much more information about uh, the true global scale and the global effects, especially in children of, of, of the Omicron variant. But this initial study by uh, Lindsay Wang, uh, which was a retrospective cohort study of, of EMR records of uh, over half a million um, first time COVID infections, uh, and this was in the period where we initially saw Omicron rise, so in the middle to the end of December of last year. Actually, children still remained relatively spared, so the um, risk of uh, both um, emergency visits as well as hospitalizations in children, uh, when we compare that to the Delta variant, uh, was much, much smaller. And as you can see on the right side, uh, the, these sort of trends, when we compare Omicron to Delta, uh, hold when we look at really all age groups, the five to 11 year olds and the teenagers uh, 12 to 17. And we, do see, we did see this similar data in the adult population as well. 
Um, and a subsequent uh, study by the same authors uh, concurred that really overall Omicron in children is uh, less severe than the previous variants that we knew, including the wild type variant from uh, the initial COVID surge. But we must ask ourselves then, is this just a numbers game? And because we know that Omicron is much more transmissible, uh, even if the, the, the overall severity of the disease is much lower, because we're gonna have, we've, we've seen so much more children uh, infected with the virus, are we gonna see a, a spillover of more severe cases? So this is a, uh, a recent study from, uh, that looked at uh, cases up until January. Um, and at the peak of uh, Omicron hospitalizations, which was about in children, which was about just over seven per 100,000, um, which was about four times that of the Delta peak, uh, the largest of the increases, uh, again, as we saw in the previous data with the, the initial surge was in the young children, so the children under uh, five. Um, and this is my one line on vaccines. Uh, monthly hospitalization rates among the unvaccinated adolescents was just over 23 per 100,000, uh, which was about six times that of fully vaccinated adolescents. So we can, we are somewhat reassured that um, vaccines still held some protection for these children. But what about the really young? So I mentioned that the zero to five years old were uh, really seem to always be the children most hospitalized and most affected. Um, and, and how does this change with the, with the Omicron variant? Well, hospital admissions of children under one, although they have uh, risen steeply, which has obviously coincided with the, the increased transmission of, of Omicron, the proportion of children admitted uh, unfortunately also increased. So it, the uh, hospitalization in uh, under ones in December to mid-January with children affected with uh, this particular variant of COVID uh, was about 42%, which was much higher than we previously saw with the, the, the previous variants in the pandemic, um, just over 30% in the first wave, then again, just over 30% with the Delta wave. But not all is lost. So when we look at the uh, actual admissions, the admissions actually were less sick than the previous variant, which is really the most important thing in my mind. So they, these uh, admissions with Omicron in this young population overall required less oxygen. So about half that of the previous variants required less ICU admissions, just under 10% versus four, uh, 14%, required less mechanical ventilation, less non-invasive ventilation, and had a lower mean length of stay, which I think is, is probably the most important thing. And overall, um, many of these children were admitted for observation alone and received no treatment. So one must also ask ourselves whether or not we were treating ourselves by admitting these uh, really young patients um, or whether or not they truly needed to be admitted. Uh, so what do we see at CHEO? Is this different than what we've been seeing in the data uh, worldwide? When we haven't obviously crunched the numbers yet, but anecdotally, our local experience really has mimicked all the data that has been seen in the US and worldwide. We've seen, as you guys all know, increased hospitalizations in pediatric patients. However, these hospitalizations overall have had really minimal uh, uh, severe disease. Um, we've also seen increased admissions uh, with incidental test positivity, where children have been admitted with other conditions and found to be uh, COVID positive, but likely not a contrib contribution to their admission. And we've also seen more upper uh, respiratory disease as opposed to the more kind of traditional lower respiratory pneumonitis or pneumonia that we saw with previous uh, variants. So this begs the question, is Omicron really just like any other pediatric seasonal respiratory virus? And I'm really hoping that in the future, that statement really holds true. But why are children less affected than adults? I mean, this is really a stark contrast between what we've seen in the adults and the severity of the disease in adults, both with previous variants and with Omicron to some extent, versus children who seem relatively spared. And there's lots and lots of theories on why that is the case. And uh, this is one uh, review from Petra Zimmerman in Switzerland and Nigel Curtis in, um, in Australia, who's quite a, a quirky character, who tried to summarize some of the different proposed factors that are 
protective in children. And some of the main overarching themes are differences in immune systems in children, uh, whether or not they have some protection from recurrent or concurrent infections or cross reactivity with other seasonal coronaviruses. Um, or differences in their anatomy, particularly the endothelium of the lung uh, and the expression of, of certain receptors uh, that uh, are important for uh, SARS-CoV-2 attachment. And there are also uh, other kind of theories uh, relating to microbiota, um, other comorbidities, what role does vitamin D play? Uh, and as we age, uh, the uh, how our immune system also changes and this concept of immunosenescence in older people and this uh, quite interesting word that I'm, uh, I'm sure Nigel Curtis has made up called inflammaging, which is just a propensity for inflammation as you get older. So I just lastly, before I get into some of the specific treatments, I thought this was a, a, a great um, uh, scheme of the pediatric versus the adult lung, which uh, uh, explain some of those uh, previous points in the previous slide. So when we compare the pediatric lung to the adult lung uh, in the context of COVID-19, uh, when the pediatric lung uh, has increased immunomodulatory cytokines, so that's uh, cytokines like IL-10 and IL-13, the adult lung has the more uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-6, and, and IL-6 will become important with one of the treatments that I'll touch on in a second. Similarly, as I mentioned, in the pediatric lung, in the, in the alveolar cells, there's decreased epithelial expression of ACE2 and Tempris-22 versus increased expression of those receptors in the, in the adult lung. Uh, and then overall in the pediatric uh, uh, lung, there's better preservation of the endothelial barrier, whereas in the, the adult lung, you have uh, disruption of this endothelial barrier uh, inflammation and uh, which can lead to the um, uh, activation of the immune system and neutrophils in uh, the area, which further exacerbates inflammation. So uh, what treatments do we have at the moment uh, for COVID-19, particularly as it pertains to children? So at the start of the uh, initial wave, to be honest, we didn't have anything. Uh, we did uh, very quickly uh, uh, recognize the importance of, um, of uh, supportive care, the importance of proning, uh, but we didn't have any specific COVID treatments. Then uh, came along uh, a, the initial report in June uh, from Gilead's initial trial, uh, uh, phase three trial with remdesivir, which is a repurposed drug that was initially trialed with Ebola that didn't have much of an effect at all. Um, the mechanism of action is that it's a, a adenosine analog, so its role is to bind the viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, essentially to halt replication. The initial trial, uh, albeit somewhat small, did demonstrate that the, a five-day course of remdesivir uh, was 65% more likely to have clinical improvement at day 11 versus standard of care alone. However, it didn't seem like a 10-day course or a more protracted course made much of a difference in comparison to the five-day course. And in fact, the 10-day course um, of uh, treatment with remdesivir versus standard of care, although it was favorable and trending towards st statistical significance, really there wasn't a difference uh, between a 10-day course and standard of care alone, which was different than the five-day course. Then came along the WHO Solidarity Trial, which was a, a, a big uh, consortium, uh, similar to the uh, recovery trial, which also evaluated the uh, effects of remdesivir. And unfortunately, the effects were less um, than previously stated by the initial Gilead study. So in this uh, Solidarity Trial, remdesivir really had little or no effect on hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Uh, as indicated by their primary outcomes of overall mortality, initiation of ventilation, and duration of hospital stay. However, the, 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 most, uh, the, the biggest critique of this particular trial is that uh, remdesivir was likely not used at the appropriate time. And, and in fact, the, the biggest benefit from remdesivir, which I'll get to in a, a couple of slides, is really at the beginning of Ill, illness when the pathology is really driven by the virus itself as opposed to inflammation secondary to the virus. But what about remdesivir as prevention? So I just talked about remdesivir as a treatment modality, as an antiviral, but what about trying to stop the virus from progressing to severe disease? 
So this evidence comes from the pine tree uh, uh, trial, which was a double blind RCT of uh, over 60 year olds with obesity or other uh, medical comorbidities uh, with early um, either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic disease in the first week that were not hospitalized obviously because they were uh, minimally or, no, or not symptomatic who received a three day course of preventative remdesivir. And the results of the pine tree study showed an 80% lower risk of hospitalization or death when compared to placebo and importantly, no safety concerns. But how do we apply this to our high risk pediatric patients? I mean, obviously this trial didn't include any pediatric population, any pediatric patients and the population is quite different than the one that we see. Secondly, we need to account for uh, the fact that this is an IV treatment and what that the practicality behind bringing children into the hospital or into a center, especially those uh, uh, with multiple comorbidities uh, who we it may be difficult to mobilize uh, and where we want to minim minimize exposures both to the patient themselves, the child themselves, as well as to as well as to others. So Practically, uh, remdesivir as prevention has been quite difficult to implement, particularly in the pediatric population, and uh, evidence base for pediatrics is minimal uh, at present, but hopefully that will uh, change in the future. So overall, with remdesivir in children, what do we need to see moving into the future? We need to see pediatric data. So we don't really have any pediatric data at the moment, and we're really relying on adult data, which, as we all know as pediatricians, uh, children are really not just small adults and, and their physiology is different and the social circumstances are different and that all affects how we treat them. Secondly, we need PK studies and there is an ongoing Gilead study to really determine the appropriate dose of remdesivir in children. Um, uh, although unfortunately the uh, results have been delayed and that was because of the um, initially the alpha variant and followed by the delta variant. So hopefully soon we'll have uh, better dosing uh, regimens. And like any drug uh, that's just starting to be used, we need long-term safety data. And this includes long-term safety data, particularly in children. All right, let's move on quickly to steroids. So as we know, you've probably seen us uh, as an ID service uh, using steroids in certain uh, pediatric populations that have been admit admitted to CHEO, but, but who needs steroids? Why are we prescribing steroids in some children versus others? And this really comes from the recovery trial uh, collaborative which initially studied the use of low-dose dexamethasone in COVID-19 patients. So this was um, hospitalized patients, uh, which received uh, low-dose dexamethasone up to six milligrams, or in children, a dose of uh, 0.15 milligrams per kilogram once a day for 10 days or until discharge, whichever uh, came first. Uh, and what the, this particular arm of the recovery trial showed was that there was a lower 28-day mortality among those that were receiving uh, either invasive uh, mechanical ventilation or oxygen alone at randomization. So if we look at the bottom uh, uh, diamond here, if we pool all patients together, we can see that the patients receiving low-dose dexamethasone did better. But looking a little bit more in depth at this uh, 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 patient population, what we can actually see is that really the benefit comes primarily from those that are either uh, receiving invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen alone, as opposed to those receiving no oxygen uh, at all. And in fact, when we look at the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, on the right, those that are not receiving uh, any oxygen actually giving them dexamethasone, they seem to do worse. Uh, so we reserve the use of steroids in children in the population defined by this study uh, whom uh, either need oxygen uh, or uh, non-invasive or invasive uh, ventilation, as opposed to all children admitted with, um, with COVID-19. More on the anti-inflammatory front. So I mentioned previously in my slide that looked at the differences in the uh, in the pneumocytes and the lung physiology in children versus adults, uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-6. So tocilizumab is an anti-IL-6 um, biologic, which was studied uh, first in the REMAP-CAP trial and subsequently also studied in uh, uh, other studies, including the recovery trial. The uh, evidence for the use of tocilizumab, as I mentioned, first came out of the REMAP-CAP trial, which studied critically ill adult patients. So again, no pediatric patients were uh, um, included in this study. 
and it included both tocilizumab and the lesser known slash lesser used uh, cerilimab, but an, uh, an equal uh, anti-IL-6 biologic. And they looked at uh, whether or not this increased the organ support free days, which was defined by a lack of cardiovascular or uh, respiratory support. They did exclude uh, people uh, that they believed uh, were likely to die imminently. Uh, and they were given one, uh, uh, those included were given one dose of tocilizumab within 24 hours of admission to ICU. So this was a critically ill uh, patient population. And if there was no improvement, they were uh, able to allocate a second dose uh, within 24 hours. However, the main criticism at this point was that not all uh, these patients were microbiologically confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2, although epidemiologically at that point, most uh, critically ill patients admitted to ICU or hospital with uh, a particular phenotype were likely to be uh, COVID-19 infections. So the results, as you can see here, both with tocilizumab and cerilimab, which had much less numbers, uh, both improved the uh, uh, organ-free support uh, days, and uh, that uh, result holded when you uh, or held when you pooled both uh, tocilizumab and cerilimab together, which is uh, outlined really nicely in uh, colored form uh, here in the red versus the standard of control uh, of care or the control group. Again, we need to think of this in what is the pediatric context. So tocilizumab, um, it is used in the pediatric populations and other rheumatologic and hematologic conditions like systemic onset JA, uh, cytokine release syndrome with uh, CAR-T therapy and hematologic malignancies. So we do have a pediatric dosing schedule, which um, already helps. We do need to consider the risk of concurrent infections or the risk of uh, unearthing latent infections like TB or strongyloides if they uh, patients have traveled or viral uh, the viral hepatitises. And secondly, the fact that after use, uh, we, it would be prudent to wait uh, a period of time for vaccines uh, uh, in order to ensure that we have maximal vaccine response. Um, in the Recovery trial, adolescents were included. So we do have some pediatric data, albeit uh, I must admit that the numbers on their own are very small, which as we all know, limits um, subgroup analyses. And lastly, um, in the context of inflammation driven by uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, we often use inflammatory markers like CRP, but in the context of someone who's gotten tocilizumab, unfortunately, these markers are no longer of use. And that's just because of the direct effect on CRP production that tocilizumab has by blocking IL-6 production. Lastly, on the anti-inflammatory front, um, so tocilizumab is an IV treatment, um, and there's obviously limited stock of a, an expensive uh, uh, drug. Um, so other anti-inflammatories were trialed, one of which uh, uh, an oral anti-inflammatory uh, called baricitinib. And this was initially trialed in the ACT2 trial, uh, which combined both baricitinib and the antiviral medication remdesivir, which I previously discussed. Baricitinib is a JAK inhibitor. Uh, and in this particular trial, the ACT2 trial, um, it was shown to improve medium time to recovery. So uh, those on high flow oxygen or non-invasive uh, ventilation at enrollment the time to recovery of 10 days with a combination of treatment. Again, that was the baricitinib in combination with, with the remdesivir uh, was 10 days uh, versus the control group, which was 18 days, which is statistically significant. When we look, however, at 28 day mortality, although the percentage was lower in the baricitinib, baricitinib group, the uh, uh, numbers in the end weren't statistically significant which leads us on to the COVE barrier trial of hospitalized adults, uh, which uh, looked again at 28 day all cause mortality. And uh, this study did show a mortality benefit at uh, 28 days of 38.2%, of which is quite considerable. Um, similarly, the 60 day uh, all cause mortality was 10% versus baricitinib, which was 15%. Um, although again, the numbers are relatively small. And of importance, there was no safety concerns. So what does baricitinib, how does this uh, in the pediatric context transpire? So 
we do know that uh, although it's used rarely, it is used in, in children for certain rheumatologic conditions, certain interferonopathies, such as the Cardi Gutierre syndrome. We do have, as a result, pediatric dosing um, schedules. Uh, again, children were included in randomization in the recovery trial, although similar to the tocilizumab arm, uh, numbers were small and data is yet to be uh, released, um, although that arm has closed, so hopefully we will have some data soon. And we must also uh, manage uh, the risks of concurrent anti-inflammatory use, particularly when it pertains to concurrent use of biologics, um, and, and we need to be quite cautious when using baricitinib in conjunction with others. We've heard a lot lately about neutralizing antibodies and, and how they may prevent uh, either asymptomatic or early disease uh, coming into hospital. So the initial um, uh, neutralizing antibody cocktail, which you may have heard of is uh, Regen Covi or Regeneron, and it has different names in, in different parts of the world. But unfortunately, with the emergen emergence of the Omicron variant, this has become really not particularly useful at all. However, fortunately, uh, a, a different uh, neutralizing antibody cocktail, citrovimab, which uh, you may have heard of in the news more recently, when given early in the course of disease, uh, uh, again, similar to the mantra which surrounded the pine tree study with remdesivir, if given in the first seven days uh, in people that have mild illness and that are not hospitalized, um, there does seem to be uh, uh, a a, an improvement and, and uh, these people that uh, get monoclonal antibodies seem to be admitted to hospital less often. It is an IV infusion. Uh, and again, just like remdesivir, that uh, does create some barriers, especially when uh, we, are, we could propose giving this to children. So again, when we look at neutralizing antibodies, what does this mean for children? Uh, because it's again, one of these treatments that is studied less in children. So I think the bottom line that we need to take away from the use of neutralizing antibodies in the pediatric population is that it really needs to be the right patient at the right time. So the right patient, meaning multiple additive risk factors and comorbidities is really the key. So for example, a child that has trisomy 21 and has had a previous cardiac repair that is undergoing ALL treatment. So multiple risk factors for severe disease. And there could be various permutations of, of, of what those comorbidities look like. That's just an example. And at the right time, obviously, we need to give this early. Uh, and, and there really has been limited data on the use of neutralizing antibodies later in the course of illness. It is approved like uh, several of the other treatments for children over 12 years old and over 40 kilograms. And that's extrapolating from the adult data. But this doesn't mean that we can never use it in younger children, and we have considered it um, at CHEO and elsewhere in younger children that we feel are at uh, very high risk for progressing to severe disease. Uh, and as a result, uh, um, we have created, uh, and uh, Jason Brophy has led on a CHEO pathway uh, for citrovimab use in conjunction with, um, with our adult colleagues uh, in the hospital across the street. So, if you ever feel that you have a patient who perhaps could benefit uh, from early use of uh, neutralizing antibodies, particularly citrovimab, um, there is a pathway and we would be happy to help in that circumstance. And as I mentioned, acting early is of utmost importance if you are thinking of considering this treatment. So going away from antivirals and anti-inflammatories a little bit, um, I just wanted to very briefly touch base on antiplatelet therapy as there has been lots of um, small studies, uh, case reports, and uh, more recently, the recovery data surrounding antiplatelet therapy with aspirin. Um, and in the recovery trial, although no children were included in this arm, um, the uh, data suggests that there is an associated reduction in thromboembolic events. Um, however, this did uh, lead to increased major bleeding events. So I think we need to very carefully weigh the risks and the benefits and ensure that we're not uh, uh, harming our patients with some of the treatments that we're using uh, for COVID-19. There was, however, a slightly shorter duration of hospitalization. I'm not sure that can entirely biologically be chalked up to the antiplatelet therapy alone and a higher proportion of patients were discharged alive within 28 days. Again, probably difficult to extrapolate uh, from secondary to the antiplatelet therapy on, in its own right. Um, but it wasn't associated with reductions in 28-day mortality or the risk of progression. Uh, 
to invasive mechanical ventilation or death, which was really their the composite endpoint for all of the therapies in the recovery trial. And like I mentioned, this arm was not available to children. So what again, what's the, 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 the bottom line for children that we treat is that really there's very little role for aspirin in the context of COVID-19. And, and again, I, I mentioned this in the context of respiratory disease because we do use it uh, for PIMS-DS or MIS-C, particularly in those with Kawasaki's phenotypes, uh, which is really a different kettle of fish. And although not an antiplatelet therapy, I just wanted to mention here briefly because there was initial reports, um, uh, particularly from, Fran from France and from the, the French government where there was considerable worry about using antipyretics in the context of children with COVID-19. Um, but this has been studied and found to be safe. So we can use Tylenol, we can use ibuprofen uh, safely in children with, uh, with symptomatic uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And lastly, anticoagulation. Again, systematic studies in children are rather limited, uh, and so we do need uh, more evidence as it pertains to children specifically um, for uh, low molecular weight heparin or heparin. And, and similarly, there's been different approaches, whether or not we prophylax uh, children or we treat them. But in the grand scheme, there's a lot to consider. There's the comorbidities, uh, the degree of immobility, the coagulation profile, the platelet count, the risk of bleeding. As I mentioned, we don't wanna create more harm in our pediatric patients. What's the body habitus of the patient? What's their inflammatory profile? Because the more inflammation, the more uh, coagulable uh, people are. Do they already have a DVT? Do they already have a pulmonary embolism? Do they have a line inside you? And do they have a clot associated with that line? There's lots and lots of factors that it, we must consider in our pediatric population. So bottom line, in our, in our children that we treat, really an individualized approach is the key. And I think of even more importance is don't underestimate the, the, the extreme value in asking a friend. So really our hematology colleagues are exceptionally vital in making these individualized um, decisions. Lastly, lastly, antibiotics. Um, so we love to be antimicrobial stewards, but we need evidence to back this up in the context of COVID-19. So I'm gonna go uh, to the ICERIC, back to the ICERIC uh, database that I mentioned earlier in my first couple of slides, just to mention that this has really been systematically studied and the occurrence of bacterial super infections in uh, really all populations uh, with COVID-19 is exceptionally low. So lengthy courses of antibiotics or superimposed pneumonias are exceptionally rare, and really we can uh, be antimicrobial stewards and we really don't want to be affecting uh, the microbiota of our children uh, or breeding any further resistance. Um, so we can quite safely in most children stop antibiotics early or not start them at all. So I've discussed what does work for the most part, uh, but what doesn't work? Uh, and this is what circulates in social media a lot. Um, and uh, again, going back to not creating harm, especially in, in pediatric populations. So various regimens, various uh, different treatments have been systematically studied, mostly in the recovery trial, which was a dynamic trial that really incorporated various different um, treatment regimens uh, or treatment modalities, I should say. So things such as colchicine, calitra, hydroxychloroquine, convalescent plasma, azithromycin, and ivermectin have all been quite uh, considerably studied. Ivermectin not in the recovery trial. Uh, and colchicine in particular has not been studied in the pediatric populations, but calitra and hydroxychloroquine and convalescent plasma and azithromycin all have in the recovery trial and all have been shown not just in the recovery trial, but other um, uh, randomized control trials to really have little or no benefit at all. So I talked about what we have available now, but certainly things will continue to evolve uh, as it pertains to COVID-19 treatments in general, but, but hopefully, uh, and I'm gonna make a plug for what we need to see in children specifically, what is in the pipeline and what's to come, because certainly things will continue to evolve. So we are seeing more and more repurposed medications and, and whether or not some of these repurposed medications have uh, antiviral properties, for example, fluvoxamine, which is a, an antidepressant medication, nidazoxanide, which has in vitro been found to have some uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 uh, antiviral properties and, and was something that actually at uh, Great Ormond Street, we did use in extremely unwell children uh, in combination with remdesivir with 
um, anecdotal effects, but certainly something that needs to be uh, uh, trialed systematically in a, in a proper RCT, uh, as well as budesonide, which has uh, been shown uh, in similar respects uh, to prevention with remdesivir to show an ever so slight um, decrease in uh, requirements requirements for hospitalization when used early in the course of disease. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of others that come through the pipeline as we learn more and more about uh, this virus and, and, and how it affects both uh, adults, but in, in particular children. Um, I'm sure people have read in the news about uh, specific anti-SARS-CoV-2 oral antivirals. It's, it's, it's one thing to have the IV preventative uh, antivirals like remdesivir. Uh, but again, when I mentioned the practicality of having an IV treatment, particularly in children, it's really just has li its limitations and, and uh, practically difficult. So Paxlovid, um, which has been approved in uh, adults in Canada, not yet in children, and Molnupiravir, which is, has been approved in Europe, but not yet in, in uh, Canada, are two in the pipeline that may at some point, uh, and hopefully at some point, be systematically trialed in pediatric populations. Just to mention Paxlovid, there is some um, concern with regards to medication interactions, which may come into play, especially in our complex um, patients with multiple comorbidities on multiple medications, although it's a short course. So hopefully uh, those uh, interactions be less prominent. Uh, and those interactions seem to be more common in Paxlovid because it's a protease inhibitor versus molnupiravir. Although Paxlovid in initial trials has been shown to have better effects than molnupiravir. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. Other anti-inflammatories or other biologics like anakinra, uh, which is an anti-IL-1, uh, has or is in the midst of being trialed uh, not so much in COVID-19, but has been trialed in pediatric populations populations with PIMS-TS um, in uh, RCTs. Interferon has been looked at, although the data to date is not particularly reassuring. Uh, in fact, there is some safety concerns with interferon, so I'll put that on the back burner. And then whether or not various combination therapies like the ACT2 trial did initially with uh, combination uh, remdesivir and um, uh, baricitinib. So in the end, what is this again? Well, how does this boil down to? Uh, our populations that we treat. Um, so really what's important, and I'm gonna make a, a, a plea, and this is not, not just for COVID-19, but for really for all diseases and all therapies in children, is that we really need to include children and adolescents into uh, RCTs to have pediatric specific data. We need PK data, not just for remdesivir, but all of the other drugs that we use. We really need to be advocates, which we all are, for uh, the inclusion of uh, children in pediatric research or research in general, and, and including in that advocacy, we need to be advocates for funding for that research. Um, and we need to be coordinated. So the one thing that we could see in COVID-19 was that really the, the big trials, the WHO solidarity trial, the uh, recovery trial, really coordination of large multi-center trials uh, were exceptionally important and of, of big value. And we need that needs to trickle down to uh, coordination between children's hospitals as well. All right, lastly, for the last five minutes, because I'm hoping to leave some time for questions, um, I will talk about how the treatments uh, coincide with the stages of COVID-19 and what children do we need to be thinking about these uh, treatments with. So just one slide. So as I mentioned, there really can be uh, COVID-19 in children, really in adults, can be as well, can be divided into two main phases for all intents and purposes. There's the uh, viral phase, which is the kind of initial phase, followed by the inflammatory phase, which is probably where the majority of the severity comes from, both in children and adults. And as we can see overall, and I, I think I've made this point several times now, where Although the stages of disease are similar in adults versus children, just the extent of, the, uh, uh, of those phases is quite a bit more exaggerated in, in, in adults. So whereas we see a large inflammatory phase in, in children, or sorry, in adults, that inflammatory phase is less so in, in, in children and uh, certainly less so in children with milder disease, although that's certainly a component in the select small group of children with severe disease that end up in PICU, et cetera. 
So this is, uh, I, I'm not gonna go through this, but I just wanted to highlight this because everyone can look at it um, uh, online, but the, um, the uh, Ontario um, uh, Drugs uh, and Therapeutic Management of uh, Patients with COVID-19 has made really nice tables, which outlines um, treatment uh, versus uh, dependent on the severity of disease. And this, Unfortunately, we don't have pediatric specific tables, but we can extrapolate uh, pretty nicely from these tables to our population, which can be looked at online and are constantly changing. So um, I put the, the link there because uh, um, it's very hard to keep track of all the changes because things, uh, as we know, seem to change quite rapidly in the pandemic context. And last but not least, um, who is at risk? So we know what we can potentially treat with and when we can potentially treat, but who do we treat? So the initial data, unfortunately, was quite conflicting. So the, you, again, using the ICERIC data, um, this is the, one of the bigger initial publications by Libby Swan, which um, outlines uh, just over 650 children and young people. Uh, admitted to uh, over 100 hospitals uh, in the UK with lab-confirmed SARS-CoV-2. What this study demonstrated is really the biggest risk were those with complex neurodisability. And secondly, those that more mimic the adult phenotype were those likely to be of teenage years with obesity and other related metabolic syndrome phenotypes. Lastly, and this has been shown not just in the UK, but in, in the uh, US as well, that um, uh, ethnicity seems to also play somewhat of a part. So in the US, that's uh, predominantly African-American and Hispanic groups. And in the UK, that has been uh, um, other minority groups like South Asian uh, and Afro-Caribbean groups. However, this has been somewhat disputed in, uh, um, in, in other studies to show actually that perhaps it's less to do with ethnicity and more to do with socioeconomic status. So when we look at postal code groupings, that seems to be somewhat more representative than ethnicity alone. Um, However, like I said, the initial data was quite conflicting. So the, uh, a subsequent study, this was a, uh, a single center study at Great Ormond Street that looked at all of the uh, uh, COVID-19 pediatric patients admitted to PICU, really didn't show that any underlying medical vulnerability was a risk factor for severe disease requiring PICU admission. So slightly conflicting evidence. However, again, oh, we have this new variant and really is this a different ball game? And I think only time will tell. So as I mentioned here, really there's a whole kind of smattering of, of uh, comorbidities associated with admissions with COVID-19. And this is data from the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in the UK. And there doesn't really seem to be an over-representation of one uh, uh, system-based comorbidity over another. But again, like I mentioned, with increased amounts of children being infected with the, the virus, we, it's yet to be determined really how Omicron will change this. And really we need more data to determine this. So just a couple very quick case series of, particular, of, of specific uh, comorbidities. So this uh, was uh, again, critical uh, uh, pediatric COVID-19 patients admitted to ICU. This was a small case series, just 11 patients, four had ARDS, three had seizures, one of which had leukemia, one had uh, heart disease, and one had type one diabetes, and there was two premature patients. There was no transplant patients or primary immune deficiencies in this small cohort and no deaths. And overall, all these children did um, really well. In fact, these authors have uh, recently published a follow-up study that showed up to two years, all the patients admitted to this particular center uh, did very well. Uh, were the results similar in the states? Uh, and the answer is for the most part, yes. Um, so this is a study out of New York Presbyterian, uh, which was a case series of over 50, uh, of 50, sorry, children hospitalized with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, of which nine required mechanical ventilation, one of which in this cohort was immunosuppressed. Uh, but disease severity was not found to be uh, significantly higher in immunocompromised. Uh, patients in the grand scheme of things. Obesity was found to be a risk factor, although again, small numbers, 
uh, and uh, again, multiple additive uh, comorbidities seem to be the biggest risk as opposed to one in particular. Uh, again, American data uh, show of uh, uh, deaths among patients under 21 this time uh, associated with SARS-CoV-2. In this cohort of uh, 17 of 121 uh, had either cancer or immunosuppressive conditions and 54 again had two or more comorbidities. Lastly, uh, just looking at more multinational data. So this is a uh, European a multinational cohort of over 500 uh, cases in Europe. Uh, again, mostly from the first wave that showed that a very small proportion had either immunodeficiency or, or were on immunosuppressive therapies, uh, including uh, chemotherapy. And there was only four deaths, one of which was uh, post uh, bone marrow transplant. I'm just going to skip over a couple of slides here. I'm gonna talk just for the last two minutes uh, on immunosuppression and immunodeficiency more specifically. So I think what the, the, the main message that I wanna portray here is that really there isn't a huge signal that immunodeficiency or immunosuppression on its own is an independent risk factor for COVID-19. However, we have very small numbers. This has really been not systematically studied and we're really relying on case reports and case series. Um, what about transplant patients? Similarly, again, we're relying on small numbers, case series, but overall in the case series that we have, um, really the numbers uh, of severe cases or the numbers admitted to ICU or the number of deaths have been relatively small. This has been the case also with heart transplants, although this is just a small case study in the US of four um, uh, heart transplants, all of which uh, did, did well and had mild disease, in fact. What about inflammatory bowel disease? Again, uh, I mean, the, I, I'm really reinforcing the message that, that I said in the first slide that overall children do well, including children with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And this is just a, a study of, uh, of a small study of uh, cases of COVID-19 in those with IBD from 23 countries. Again, relatively small numbers of severe disease. In our world, in the ID world, what about HIV? Well, really, although the, the, the initial, uh, there was initial scare about how our patients with HIV would uh, cope with this new viral disease, really, our children have done exceptionally well. Uh, and and uh, especially those children, which are the vast majority of the ones we treat in pediatrics that are on uh, antiretroviral therapy, therapy and fully suppressed. So really there's been no cases of severe HIV, at least in the UK, uh, of children admitted with COVID-19 uh, to either ICU or severe disease. However, this is again still early and with increasing amounts of, of Omicron and increasing transmission in this population, although we can be reassured, we still need uh, ongoing surveillance data. Last but not least, malignancy. Again, uh, trying to really reinforce the, the, the message that Malignancy on its own, uh, ten, uh, children with uh, that test positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 do relatively well as well. So in this multi-center study, uh, as you can see here, 15% were completely asymptomatic and 74% only had mild symptoms where uh, just a, a fraction of a percent had uh, either moderate or severe symptoms, which is quite reassuring. Uh, other comorbidities, so asthma, CF, other chronic lung, uh, other chronic kidney diseases, again, all very small pediatric case series, but all follow very similar trends to all of the specific diseases I've just talked about. So in summary, again, I'm getting dangerously close to my time up here. And I wanna leave some time for questions. Threshold for treatment in those with comorbidities, again, multiple comorbidities, those that are additive, uh, that will increase their risk of progression to severe disease, those with multiple organ involvement, uh, although probably in the grand scheme of things will still do well, our threshold to treat, especially our threshold to treat preemptively, will uh, probably be lower. But it's a little bit of a balancing act. And as I mentioned before, we do not want to be giving our pediatric patients any treatment that could potentially cause harm. So the bottom line is most children will not need treatment. Uh, and most children will equally not need preventative treatment. And those small uh, children that may be considered really should be discussed in a multidisciplinary forum. And just for some 
perspective to end. This is just some initial data on uh, deaths uh, due to COVID-19 in the UK. A and really we see all cause deaths, uh, um, unintentional injuries, other lower respiratory uh, uh, illnesses really still make up the bulk of uh, pediatric uh, uh, mortality, irrespective of being in the uh, midst of a uh, pandemic. So what that means really in my mind, although treatment uh, specific for COVID-19 and COVID-19 disease, especially severe disease is important in children, what we also need to consider is what the collateral effects and what the treatment of the collateral effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are on children and adolescents. Because in the grand scheme of things, I think those will probably be more evident the, in years to come. So thanks so much for listening. I'm hopeful that I left a couple minutes for questions and sorry to uh, have rushed through the last couple of slides. But thank you, Justin. That was really an amazing presentation. You went through so much uh, material and summarized it so well for us. Uh, I particularly really appreciated that. I know many of our participants will as well. Um, we do have maybe one or two minutes for questions. Uh, the first question actually came in the chat from uh, Tom Cabessi, our respirologist. Uh, do you see a role for tocilizumab for any pediatric patients currently? Chuck answered that in the, in the chat, but I'll see what you have to say as well. Yeah. Um, sorry, I can't see the chat. So I hope I say the same thing as Chuck, but I do think that there is a role. Um, I certainly have used it uh, in uh, pediatric populations. Um, I think it needs to be used sparingly. And in, again, in the right patient at the right. Okay. Clearly unwell in ICU that are very hyperinflammatory, then I do think that there is a role. Again, though, I need to stress the importance of this. These are really big decisions that need to be made in a multidisciplinary forum. Great. Uh, and it wasn't meaning to test you. Uh, Chuck indicated that you've, we've given it to one patient at GEO so far. Yeah. So I think that definitely is in line with um, how he responded to that. Um, we do have maybe one minute time for one uh, question or comment if anybody would like to raise. I know. Uh, Nicole. Nicole raised her hand. Thank you. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> great. So that was really great. Thanks very much, Justin. And I think it's really worthwhile. I really liked your slide on the phases of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection because yeah. I think these preemptive therapies and rendisivir and even monoclonals are really important to give in the viremic phase. And then we get into the inflammatory phase. And I think that was very, very important that you have to sort of assess the individual patients, see what phase they are at the illness because an antiviral like remdesivir, uh, the, you know, the in, uh, Israeli trial really showed that you need to even give it before, uh, right at the time that they're viremic. So that that's why it didn't have that grave, great an effect when people were hospitalized before or the later stage of the hospitalization. So that was great. And then I guess I just have to reinforce your comment about collateral damage. We see so many people that haven't been seen by their physician, either not given vaccines or delayed diagnosis of TB or malignancy. So I just wanna thank you for bringing that up as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. I just, I, I do think that we as all, as pediatricians, we recognize this, but I do think that in the media, we see a lot about treatment and a lot about specific treatment with an adults and children, but really what I worry about, and although that's certainly very important uh, and we all care about that, uh, I think really what I'm worried about is the is educational opportunities that are missed, uh, you know, even things outside of the medical realm. So educational opportunities and really how the discrepancy in those that are already less fortunate, how those discrepancies will increase. And so I really hope that there'll be an equal focus on non-pharmacological uh, treatments and, and advocacy in that realm as well. That's great. Thank you so much, Justin, uh, for a really fantastic presentation. Um, and we hope that Chuck is correct that this will be the end soon. The end is coming soon. Uh, in terms of COVID, not, uh, not to further presentations from you. So thank you very much and um, have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.